What if I am not forgiven? You are forgiven. Stop doubting God's promise. God doesn't lie. Take his word. In the moment you confess, God takes your sin upon himself and he gives his righteousness upon yourself. And God is the one who committed the sin and you are righteous because he gives you his robe of righteousness. Again, it's my joy and my privilege to be with you. And uh, we start the Sabbath together. Isn't that wonderful? Very soon in heaven, we are going to spend Sabbath not only together, but together with the angels and with Jesus. Isn't that nice? The Bible says that heaven is above our richest imagination. But until then, until we all go to heaven, if I remember what we talked, we said that in the times that we live, with the urgency of the signs and the prophecies happening around us, Jesus told us to prepare. And Jesus told us to prepare in some ways, and one of them was pray and watch. And then Jesus told them that whenever two or three, he didn't say 200 or 300, he said two or three. So you have no excuse if you say, well, my church is very small. We don't have except 20 people. That's good enough. God can do, give victory through 10 as he can give victory through a million. Because it's not about our power. It's about God's power. And too many times we trust our methods instead of trusting God. And so I said that when people pray together, as the spirit of prophecy says, pray, plan, and work. When people pray and plan and work, God gives results. Now, you remember I told you that I moved, I gave you a case study, an example. I moved in 2010 in a district that had some challenges. Number one, they didn't believe in evangelism. They said evangelism doesn't work. Though it is Jesus' command, the Great Commission is not called the Great Suggestion. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. It is Jesus' command, go and preach the gospel. And that command was not given to the pastors alone. That command was given to whom? To everyone. To everyone. To everyone. Ellen White says that everyone that is born is gone in God's kingdom is born as a missionary. Basically, when you are called to church, you are called to ministry, you are called to serve to everyone. And so saying that, saying that, I said that I was called in a district that didn't believe in evangelism, didn't believe in Bible studies, didn't believe in outreach. The church had no growth for 72 years. The church was divided in conflicts. The city was half rich, half Baptists. Good people, but they said they are saved already. They don't need to come to our church. In fact, in fact, the Baptist pastors told their members, every time our people did evangelism, they told their members, don't go there. That's an evil church. That's a sect. Don't go there. And so nobody came. What do you do? I told you, my wife and I started to, and you say, oh, pastor, that's too simple. Give us something complicated. Well, God works through simple methods. The problem is not with prayer. The problem is with us. We pray small prayers and we expect big answers because we are not committed. The people of faith in the Bible have been people of prayer. Listen carefully, Abraham, Moses, John, Peter, Paul, you name it. All the people of prayer, all the people of faith in the Bible have been people of prayer. Those people got to the degree that they would talk to God. And we are supposed to be that way. And so my wife and I prayed. We prayed for them. We prayed with them. We taught them to pray. They prayed together until the church became a praying church. That changed everything. The Spirit of Christ says when people pray, it brings them closer to God and closer to one another. When they started to pray together, there were no more conflicts, no more division, no more bickering, no more, div no more tension. All those problems solved by themselves because people prayed together. And we had activities together. And we had 
seminars and sermons together. And very interesting, we got together and prayed for God's plan. You cannot go to God with your plan and seek God's blessing for your plan. If you want God's blessing, you need God's plan. Instead of seeking God's blessing, you need to seek God's plan and then you have his blessing. When God, I want you to imagine, what if Joshua went to God and said, Lord, we need to take Jericho and this is the plan. We are going to go and we are going to fight and the elderly is going to attack from the left and the young are going to attack from the right and please bless our plan. If Joshua went to God with a plan, there would have been a lot of dead people. If you want victory, you need to receive God's plan. Did you hear me? God gave him the plan. Very important, when God works, nothing makes sense. People say, oh, I cannot do that, I don't understand. Don't try to understand God. Try to trust God. The song doesn't say, understand and obey. It says, trust and obey. You don't need to understand God because you have a brain that is small compared to God's brain. My brain is like this, God's brain is infinite. You will never understand God because you are not God. You need to trust God. Trust and obey. There is no other way. And so, when God gives you the plan, usually it's so big that you will not understand. You need to have a close relationship with God. You need to be a person of prayer. To, tr to know him enough, when he says, like Abraham, leave your country, you need to know him enough not to say, what's going to happen to me? You need to leave your country. If God says, I want you to build an ark, you don't need to say, Lord, but why would I build an ark? There has never been rain. When God says, build an ark, you don't say, Lord, I don't have the money. You build an ark. You need to know him enough to have a close relationship, to be a person of prayer, to know his voice enough so you obey when he talks. And you say, Pastor, how do you know God's voice? How do you distinguish God's voice from my voice and from Satan's voice and from the voice when I eat too much pizza and I don't sleep enough? How do you distinguish the voices? How do you distinguish God's voice? Very simple. Very simple. If you call me, I don't know your voice. If my wife calls me, I don't need to say who is there. I know her voice. If I say who is there, then I don't eat tonight and I sleep on the couch. How do I know her voice? Because we talk all the time. Don't expect to know God's voice if you never talk to him, only in crisis. You need to talk to him all the time so you learn his voice. The Bible says, my sheep know my voice. The Bible says, your ears would hear a voice behind you saying, this is the road, this is the path. You probably heard me on the internet telling the story. I eat often. I don't eat much. I just eat often. And my wife knows that if I don't eat, I start shaking. I went to the doctor. The doctor said, you are okay. You just have a fast metabolism. You burn everything fast. So my wife gives me sandwiches. And my wife calls me every four hours. And she knows because I need to eat. And she says, honey, it's 10 o'clock. Did you eat? Oh, honey, I am busy. I have a meeting. Get a sandwich. Okay, honey, get a banana, eat something. Okay, honey, love you, love you, bye, bye. One minute later, she called him back. Honey, did you eat? No, I told you to eat. Okay, eat now. Okay, love you, love you, bye. Four hours later, hey, how are you doing? I I'm busy, I have a meeting. Eat a banana. Okay, I'm gonna call you in one minute. Okay, love you, love you. One minute later, did you eat? Yes, okay, love you. Four hours later, she calls me again every four hours. And then I drive home, I go between mountains, I lose signal, I have no signal. She calls me and she says, honey, banana, love you. How do I know that is my wife? How, how do I know? I know the voice because we talk every four hours. And I know the message because she's consistent. When you pray and study, you know the voice because you talk all the time and you know the message because God doesn't change. We change. God doesn't. He's consistent throughout the Bible. His message is always the same. If you keep talking to God, you are going to know the voice and you are going to know the message. How do you expect to know God's voice if you don't talk to him? You need to spend time with him to learn his voice. Does it make sense? And so, going back, going back, 
How do you know God's plan? You need to spend time with God. You need to spend quality time in prayer and study of the works. Ellen White says in Testimony 6, through prayer we talk to God. Through the word, God talks to us. And she says, prayer and study of the word should never be separated. They go only together, like a dialogue. You pray and study and pray and study. So you talk and God talks and you talk. Prayer is the breath of the soul. I've never seen anybody breathing only out. People breathe out and breathe in, breathe out as prayers. You talk, God talks, you talk. What you, we pray, we talk, and then we live. But what you say is not so important. What God says is important. And God talks to the world. So you need to study. Pray, and then study, and then pray, and then study. So this way you get to know God. Because you don't study to do a duty. You study to know God. What's the benefit to study if you don't know Jesus? The Bible says an eternal life is to know God, if you don't stu if you study as a duty, you get nothing. You need to study to know God, to have a relationship, to understand what he wants to say to you. Going back, in my church, <coughs> I call them to pray for God's plan. I said, you tried evangelism the way you think you should do evangelism. It didn't work. What if we try evangelism the way God thinks we should do evangelism? Well, evangelism is evangelism, pastor. You have 30 days, a good pastor preaches, and then we go home. I said, that's what you think. Let's see what God thinks. So we started to pray for God's vision. First, we prayed, what should we do as a church? And we got television, and we got radio, and we got internet, and we got evangelism, and we got canvassing, and we got so many things that, I mean, we did 250 Bible studies a year. Have you ever heard of a church, moreover, an Anglo church, in an advanced country? I mean, if I ask them, usually, how many Bible studies do you have a year? Five. How many Bible studies do you have in this church? Two. How many Bible studies do you have, Pastor? 250. That's quite a lot of Bible studies each year. And so we had a lot, but we prayed how to reach the city because God gave us a command, go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the world. That means from the place where you live and then neighbors and the next town and the next town and then the whole country and then to the end of the world. And you see, pastor, but we are poor. We are small. We are very few. The disciples were poor and they were small and they were very few. But it's not about what you can do. It's about what God can do. We limit God because of our lack of obedience and our lack of faith. So I told the church, if we get God's plan, we'll get God's resources. God's blessing and God's power, and then we can reach the world. Yes, a small local church, 90 members, we can reach the world. Every single revival, I, in my doctoral paper, I showed the whole history, and I showed that every revival, no exception, starting with a group of one or two. One or two people prayed together and kept praying, and God gave them the plan, and God gave them the Holy Spirit, and God gave them power, and God gave them the blessing, and it spread to a city, to a country, to the whole world. Every revival has started when two get together and pray. Every, I could give you examples, I can prove it to you. The history says that. So I told them, it's not that you are very few, it's not that you are poor, it's that you don't pray. Jesus told the disciples, do not leave the city. Wait, tear down, wait a little longer, wait and pray until you receive the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, you receive power. Then go, because you go in God's power. Ellen White says, the work, when they received the Holy Spirit, the work moved with power. Thousands got baptized. Miracles happened. Sick were healed. Dead were resurrected. The, uh, the gospel went in 32 years to the whole known world with the hand of people. And she says, when the latter rain comes, the power will be even greater. She says, it's going to be above what we can imagine. Tens of thousands will get baptized. The church is going to, I mean, crowds are going to come. We'll have no room for them. 
God is going to do it again when we get together and pray. So I told my church, don't think that you are small. Don't you think that you are only 90 people? Think about God can do. Not what you can do, but what God can do. So we prayed for God's vision. Well, I was at camp meeting. I love camp meeting and I hate camp meeting. Do you know what is camp meeting? People get together, kind of all churches from the whole conference, and we have good speakers from morning to night, seminar at 8 o'clock, at 10 o'clock, at 12, at 2 o'clock, at 4, and then the plenary speaker in the evening, and all conference, all churches, all members come, and they stay in tents and in cabins. It is beautiful because people are together, and they eat good food, and you meet friends, and you talk, but it's not beautiful because they had the pastors pitch tents for everybody, and I hated tents because tents had spiders. And I was like, man, I have to pitch tents a whole week and then church members come. Why don't they pitch their own tents? And I was pitching tents the week before the camp meeting, preparing the tents for the church members that will come. Six, seven, ten thousand members would come or who knows. And I was praying, Lord, give me the vision for the church. What shall we do to reach this city? Because they have tried. They have had evangelists. They have had seminars. Nobody, nobody, zero, nobody came. What can we do, Lord? If this doesn't work, you must have a plan that works. And I prayed one day and I prayed two days and then I said, Lord, I'm going to pray tonight, today and tonight. I'm not going to sleep a second. I'm going to pray like Jacob. I'm going to grab you and I'm not going to let you go before you tell me what to do. I've been already praying for three months. It was a Monday night. I prayed, it was 9 p.m., 10 p.m., I don't know, around 1 or 2 a.m. I was on my knees next to the bed. I fell asleep during the prayer. Did you ever fell asleep during prayer? Do you think God gets angry with you? Oh, you fall asleep, I'm not going to save you. If you have, if you are the father or the mother and you have two children, one that never prays and one that prays so long that he falls asleep. Which, do, which do, one do you prefer? You understand? I fell asleep praying. I believe Jesus said, hey, my baby, you went to sleep. I am here. When we wake up, when you wake up, we are going to keep talking. That's what he says in the Bible. David says, yes, when I go to sleep, you are with me. In the watches of the night, when I wake up, you are still by my bed waiting for me. God is still there waiting for you. So you talk to him. So I fell asleep and then I woke up around 4 a.m. I was still on my knees with my head on my bed with a bunch of thoughts, a bunch of ideas. So I started to write down point one, we do this, point two, we do that. And I said, man, where are these ideas coming from? I wrote them down. I said, Jesus, if this is your answer, if you gave me the plan, I want confirmation. Because if I go to church, it's going to be blood on the wall. They are going to kill me. Pastor, are you crazy? What is this plan? I said, I need you to give me confirmation. And I prayed from 6 to about 7 when it was breakfast. Breakfast is holy. It's like Sabbath. I never miss a meal, you know. So I stopped praying because I got to go to eat, you know. And so I prayed. When I stopped praying around 7, my telephone rings. It was Dr. Schmidt from Andrews. He says, Pavel, yeah. how are you doing? Good. He says, you remember you asked me about 3, 4, 5 months ago to come to your church. How could I forget? You said no. I said, when you call me to teach about prayer, guess what I'm going to say? I'm going to say no, just as you said no to me. He says, come on, Pavel, you know that I'm scheduled two years in advance. I said, me too. So don't you call me because I'm going to say what you said. No. He says, come on, Pavel, somebody cancel my meeting. I have one Sabbath in August. Do you want me to come? I said, duh, sure I want you to come. And then I said, what do you have in mind? He says, well, in Andrews University, we need a pilot project that we have not done before. And we did it with some doctorate students to see the results. And then he said, we did step one. That was the step one that I wrote down that morning when God woke me up. And we did step two the same and step three and step five the same. And he said, these are the results. It's unbelievable. We want to practice it in your church to see how it works. I said, Dr. Schmidt, I've been praying for three months and God woke me up early in the morning with some ideas and I wrote them down and now you call me and are exactly word by word the same steps. He says, wow. I said, wow. We both, wow, you know. I said, praise the Lord. I prayed for confirmation. God gave me confirmation. Let's do it. 
Next Sabbath, I go after camp meeting. I go to my church. I said, you know you have been praying. You know I have been praying. God gave me the plan. He woke me up. I wrote it down. But they said, pastor, tell us the plan. I said, no. Please tell us the plan. No. If I tell you the plan, you'll never do it. You think that I am crazy. You think, oh, you ate too much pizza. It's not God's plan. It's your brain. I said, you need to pray as I prayed. So God gives you what he gave me. And if God gives it to you, then you will do it. So I said, go home, pray for a month. See you next month. Then I called them Monday. Hey, did you pray? I called everyone from the board. Tuesday. Hey, did you pray? Pray because Saturday I'm going to ask you in front of the church. Stand up if you didn't pray. I'm going to embarrass you in front of the church. You better pray. Oh, pastor, you're kidding. I'm not kidding. You know me. I'm going to get you up in front of the church. I'll say, this elder, I ask him to pray. And he doesn't pray. He said, you'll not do that. I will. You better pray. He said, okay, pastor. I made sure that they prayed. They prayed the whole month. Next month, we had board meeting. And they said, God impressed us. And the way we do evangelism, we can do a little better than that. I said, tell me the steps. And they told me the same steps. Not everybody, but many from the board. I said, this is it. So what do you do? You do? Listen, Christ method alone. What did he do? Did he just say, follow me? Or he did something else? What does he say? Huh? He mingled with people as one who has an interest in their own good. He ate with them. He healed them. He listened to them. He built friendship and trust. And after that, he said, follow me. And they says, nobody is going to lead to God a stranger, but only a friend. You need to build friendship so people trust you before you invite them. You need to build a relationship with them. So we said, let's build a relationship with the community because the community doesn't know us. So what did we do? What did we do? We did several steps. We did, listen, if you think about it, you go and you watch this. Do you see points number four, five, six, seven, and eight? Four, five, six, seven, and eight. I'm going to explain them now, all of them, one by one. Point four, Bible studies. They did a survey in Andrews. If they did invited people to come to church for Bible studies, only about two out of 100 invitations came. If they send Bible studies in the mail, only about one from 10,000 got baptized. If they did Bible studies in the church or in the home and they teach, they would teach, they, they, they taught the Bible studies. Only about 2% would get baptized. But if they did Bible studies in the home and they didn't teach, they allowed people to discover. 76% got baptized. A jump from 2% to 76. That's quite a big jump. So what did we do? People don't like to go to your church. But people always feel comfortable to go home. Am I right? Everybody feels comfortable when they are in their own home. So we offered in-home free Bible studies. My church told me, Pastor, they are Baptists. Some of them, some of them are millionaires. But he's going to answer. The city had 10 zip codes, postal Postal zip codes. Basically, the city was divided in 10 areas. Zip code number so and so, zip code number. And we sent invitations for free in home Bible studies only to one zip code. And that was around 12,000 homes. 12,000 homes. Only to one zip code. And we got 276 requests for Bible. 276 requests for Bible studies. My church was overwhelmed. Whoa! We thought we would get two or three. 276. Who is going to do so many Bible studies? 276 requests only from one zip, not from the whole city. People are thirsty for God. People are tired of forms. People seek God. They don't know how to find God. They don't want to go to your church or to that church. But if they can find God at home, they want to learn more about God. They want to learn more about prayer. We offer them 
that in their home comfort. But the survey says that George Barna did a survey and all people from school to death, after they finished school, 72% of people never read a book again. However, they spend nine hours a day average, more or less, between computer, internet, cell phone, and television. If you put this together, nine hours a day on cell phone, internet, television. So if people don't read, we didn't give them only written Bible studies. We gave them video Bible studies because I've seen people arguing with me when I teach them, but I've never seen anybody normal arguing with the TV. People watch TV, could be good, could be bad. Nobody argues with the TV. Hey, I don't like you. Nobody talks back to the TV unless they are crazy. And TV influences people's minds. Media manipulates people. And people watch and they just swallow and swallow and swallow and slowly they get influenced. If Satan uses media for bad, why shouldn't he use media for good to preach the gospel? So we gave them to the elderly in that time in 2010 DVD Bible studies and to the young memory stick Bible studies that had the video lessons that would go parallel with the written lessons. Very interesting. We didn't teach them. We didn't teach them. Ed Schmidt came, trained our church, and he said, this is the rule. Don't open your mouth. If you open your mouth, we did a survey, you fail. All those that we taught didn't get baptized. 76% of those that we didn't teach got baptized. People don't like to be told what to do. I don't like you to tell me what to do, and you don't like me to tell you what to do. But if they discover it, they believe it. It's not your business to teach them, to manipulate them, to push them. It's your business to give them the gospel and let the Holy Spirit convince and change them. They told us, everyone, we like you because you respect us. You don't come like the Mormons or the Jehovah or this or that to try to push us. You respect our freedom and we choose for ourselves. We said, hey, the Holy Spirit has to convince you, not me. So we offered them in-home Bible studies. We gave them video Bible studies so they would watch the TV. People are like fish. They watch the TV like, and it doesn't matter what the TV says. They believe everything. They just listen. Let them learn about Sabbath from the TV. So if they ask questions, we'll not answer. We'll say, hey, the next study is going to answer the question. Just keep watching. We'll go there. First time, knocking the door. They open the door, you know, just a little. They had the chain. Uh, Americans don't like you to knock in the door. They, they are very private. If you knock in the door, they, they think that you are a Jehovah Swedish or a Mormon or that you want to sell something and they don't like it. So they open the door. And they said, hey, you asked for a Bible study. This is your handwriting. You requested the Bible study. This is the Bible study. Bye. And they say, why didn't you mail it? Because you get so many junk mail, so, many, so, so much junk, you'll throw it in the garbage. We want to make sure that you get it. Bye. Oh, I have questions. I have no time. Bye. Because they may have questions, but they are not ready for the answers. We are the mailman. Mailman doesn't convince you to read the mail. Mailman delivers the mail. We said, I have no time. I have to deliver another 50 Bible studies. Bye. Next Sunday, we knock or next Tuesday or whatever, we knock in the door. We came with study number two. Guess what happened? They knew from the first visit that we don't try to manipulate them. We don't try to force them. We don't try to call them, come to my church, please be baptized. Please come join my, join my church. We don't ask them that. We don't sell anything. We don't. They knew, so people relaxed. When you knock in the door, they open the door large. Hey, how are you doing? Good, you, good. I came with study number two. Thank you. Hey, I appreciate that you sacrificed your time. Bye, bye. People relaxed. They knew that there is no danger that we ask them anything or sell anything. Third Sunday, we knock in the door when they are already open and relaxed, no fear, no suspicion. You know, we said, listen, Study number three, we have a prayer group. We believe in prayer. We believe that if we pray together, and Jesus said, he answers. We would like to pray for you. Tell us what to pray for. When people open their hearts, telling you their problems, so you pray for. If you listen, 
right away they know that you care. In our society, nobody cares to listen. When they say, how are you doing? They don't care how you are doing. They just hope that you say, good, good, bye. You know what I mean? Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, bye. And he's not happy Sabbath. I was at the church. I said, happy Sabbath. He said, happy Sabbath, pastor. How are you doing? Good. You, good. Your family, good. Your job, good. After church, he comes to me, pastor, can we talk? Yes. My wife left me. I asked you, how are you doing? You said, good. Oh, we don't mean it, pastor. That's how we greet each other. We don't mean it. You understand? When they say, how are you doing? They don't care. They don't want you to tell them how you are doing. They just hope that you say good and they, you leave them alone and they go. Because nobody has time and nobody cares. Everybody cares for self. When you are willing to spend time and listen and then pray for them, it means that you care. They told us there was a family, Catholic family. His son was a Catholic priest. Everybody in his family Catholic. The old man and his wife, they owned a big store. They were very rich. And he told me, I am a Catholic. My son is a Catholic priest. Nobody from my church has ever prayed for me. My son who is a priest has never prayed for me. And you come and you pray for me every week. He said, you are good people. You care. When you listen and you let them talk and they unload, they open their heart and they tell you their pain and they tell you their problems and you listen and then you pray for them. Instantly, those people value, love you, respect you, listen to you because they know you are a godly person and you care. So we prayed for them. Next week, we knock in the door. Hey, how are you doing? Good, you good. This is study number four. Hey, can I pray for you? And they said, yes. Last week, we prayed for them at the door. Now I say, listen, people are watching. Can I come in? And this is the key. Listen, folks, listen carefully. All those that we entered the house got baptized. All those that we didn't enter didn't get baptized. The key was to enter the house and build friendship. Did you hear me? The key was to enter the house and build a relationship. I said, can I come in? And the guy, I mean, remember, he said, my house is not clean. I said, hey, if you see my office, you think that is Hiroshima. It's like a bomb dropped there, all the papers. I said, don't worry, I'm not here to inspect. Is it clean? I'm here to pray. We pray right here. I don't even enter. Just, I got to go inside so neighbors don't watch us. Right here by the door. I entered by the door, closed the door, prayed and left. Well, when you enter, you enter. If I entered inside the door, next Sunday I came, I said, can I enter to pray? Yes. Can we go inside? So now I entered in the living room. <laughs> I said, can we pray? Yes. We pray together. Next week I say, hey, I have a little time. Can we do the study together? They said, yes, because by now I have already entered the house. I said, progressively, slowly, one step, not too much at first. Can I do the study with you? I said, yes. Please teach me. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not a teacher. Only Jesus is the teacher. I'm not here to teach. I need to learn too. Let's watch it together. Because if I would teach them, they would argue. Let the TV teach them. I said, let's watch it together. We sat down. We watched it together. And then I said, now I pray for you. Bye. We did that. I want you to listen carefully. We started in January. The Bible studies took about seven to nine months. It's difficult to do evangelism a month or two weeks or three weeks and to baptize people because people take a long time to change. People don't change in two weeks. We don't change in two weeks. Why would we expect others to change a whole life in two weeks? When people get baptized, they are born again. Have you seen any pregnancy that lasts two weeks and you have a baby? That's abortion. If you really want a healthy baby, you need nine months. People does, don't change, don't understand, don't have time to assimilate so much information in two weeks. We gave them Bible studies. It took between seven and nine months. People had time to think. People had time to make decisions. People had time to understand. And they had time to really go deep, understand 
all the doctrines, understand the Bible, learn. But we did the Bible studies. How long did it take? Are you sleeping? Seven to nine months. After three months, while we continued the Bible studies, parallel with the Bible studies, we started stage number two. What did we do in stage number two? What did we do? Community involvement. We attacked the city. So this is what we did. I went to the city mayor. I said, listen, we are a small church, but we want to help. What do you need? He says, well, we have 50 Baptist churches, 12 Methodist churches, seven Presbyterian churches, but they never want to help. You are a small church, the Adventist church. What can you do? I said, tell us what to do. He said, well, clean the park. The park is dirty. A lot of paper, a lot of plastic. Clean the park. I call my church. You know, my members like garbage because everybody came to clean the park. They came with plastic bags, gloves, with a truck. We went in the park and they cleaned the park and they were talking and they said, Pastor, it was fun. Can we do it again? I said, what, what is fun to clean the garbage? They said, hey, we enjoyed it. Can we do it again? So I went to the mayor. We cleaned this park. Well, clean the other one too. Next Sunday, we clean the other park. Then I went back to the mayor. Hey, we finished the parks. The parks are clean. Can we do something else? He says, well, there are some homes downtown that are dirty and it's a shame. Can you? clean in front of the homes and mow and we said yes so we went in front of the homes to clean them the elderly people that are poor came out they said how much do you want to be paid we said nothing we do it because jesus did it you want us to be baptized and i told my members say no no please don't come to my church because if you say come they say no if they don't come they said oh please can we come so you know people always want what they cannot have if they are blonde, they want to be brunette. If they are brunette, they want to be blonde. If they have curly hair, they want it straight. If it's straight, they want it curly. People always want what they don't have. They are never happy with what they have. If you say, come to church, they say, no, don't come. Well, I would like to come. You know? <laughs> so I told them, I said, say no. So you want us to come to your church? No. Why not? Because you are not prepared. You come and create problems. We want only serious people in our church. But we are serious people. <laughs> They said, why did you come? Because Jesus came. How much do you want to be paid? Nothing. We cleaned the homes. I went back to the mayor. What do you want us to do? He says, I don't know. You are the best church in the town. Feed the homeless. We went downtown two Sabbaths to feed the homeless. People would come in a line and they told us, hey, the Baptists came to feed us, but they never prayed for us. We gave them food and prayed for them. Gave them food. You would see our members praying with each one. We prayed for their blessing. And then I told the church, let's do this. I went to the, to the police and I talked to the chief of police over the whole city. I said, I want you to invite the police force to come to my church Sunday. Do you want us to be converted to the Adventist church? I said, no, God forbid, I don't want you in my church unless you repent. No. Then why do you want us to come? I want to give you a meal. I want to say thank you for your sacrifice and I want to pray for your protection. No church in my city ever has prayed. Everybody hates us and curses us. You want to pray for us? Yes, we give you food and we pray for you. Next Sunday, the police force came, not all of them. We gave them a food, didn't give them a sermon, didn't talk about state of the dead, uh, 2,300 days and nice prophecy, no. We gave them a meal, we prayed for their blessing, thanked them for their service, and then I said to the chief of police, where are the others? Well, some of them are home, some of them are on the streets. Good. I talked to my church members, divided them in groups. Monday, we went to all 22 police stations. And we, we brought them unhealthy cookies, unhealthy soda, you know, Sprite. And we said, this is for those that didn't come. This is a thank you card. These are the cookies and this is the drinks. We want to say thank you for your service and we want to pray for your protection. Guess what? Next day, it was on the news. The Adventist church is praying for the police force. The whole city knew it. Then I went to the marshal to the chief of the firefighters. I said, I want you to take all the firefighters come to my church Sunday. Why? I want to give you a meal to thank you for your service and to pray for your protection because you sacrifice yourself for our city. Next Sunday, I have pictures. The firefighters came with the fire trucks and our children from the church. Can we take a picture with the fire, you know, fire trucks? They came, we gave them a meal. We, we, we prayed for them. We thanked them for their service. 
Next Monday, I divided my members. We went to all 24 fire stations and gave them cookies and drinks and thank you cards and prayed for them. The TV, the Adventist church is praying for our police. The Adventist church is praying for our firefighters. The Adventist church is cleaning the parks. The Adventist church is cleaning the homes. The Adventist all over the news, all over the newspaper, all over the TV. Everybody would talk, how good is the Adventist church? Before, nobody knew the Adventist church. Now the whole city knew the Adventist church. Then, next Sunday, I divided my members. We went to all 11 hospitals. We visited all the nurses' stations at every level, and we prayed for the nurses, for the doctors, and for the sick. Next Sunday, we went to orphanages. Next Sunday, we went to the nursing homes. Next Sunday, we basically attacked the whole city. The whole city, after two, three months, they knew the Adventist church because we did everything in the city. That took work, that took sacrifice, but... Jesus told us, you need to be the light, you need to be the salt of the world. How do you want people to come to your church if you are not the salt? Do you follow me? When you are a blessing that everybody says, this is the best church in the city. When everybody knows if this church would close, the whole city would suffer. We need this church. When people value your church, then they come to your church. Before, nobody in your church. Now, the whole city, the whole TV, the whole radio, the whole all newspapers, everybody was talking. Now the Baptist pastor could not tell them, don't go to that church because it's bad. Because everybody knew that's the best church. After three months, while we continue to do the Bible studies, we started stage three. What was stage three? Seminars at the church. Cooking class. Diabetes class. Depression recovery class, out of debt class, out of addiction class, top smoking class, parenting class. We did 16 classes. Every week a class, every Thursday a class, every Thursday. Do you think that we did a class to teach them how to eat tofu? Why, why, why did we do those classes? Huh? To teach them how not to spend money? Nah. We did the class because people who never come to our church. We wanted them to get familiar with the church, as familiar as they are when they go home. To feel when they go to church, to feel like they go home. So we had, we didn't say, come Saturday and get baptized. We said, come Thursday for a cooking class. We are going to give you food. We are going to give you recipes, teach you how to do it. It's perfect. We are going to teach you different international types of healthy foods. So you don't, you know, you eat healthy. And then next, next Thursday, we teach you how to do this. And next Thursday, we, and people came. And people, every time they would come every Thursday for a class, we would give the class and then give a meal because when people eat, they talk and build friendship. And they started to build friendship with our members. And next Thursday again, and next Thursday, after two months, they would come to church as they would go home. They knew everybody in the church. Jimmy knew John, John knew Tom, Tom knew Mary. Everybody knew everybody. All the visitors knew, all the members, they were friends. They were eating together. They were doing seminars. Hey, how are you doing? How is your family? They were friends. They would come to our church like they would go home. They said, we love these people. We are, they are our friends. By now, you're ready to come to church. Then, after three months, how many months by now? Bible studies, three months, and then we continued the Bible studies, and the next three months we did community involvement, and then next three months we did seminars, how many months? Oh, the baby is ready to be born, nine months. And then, finally, we did evangelism. In all this process, we had the church praying every day. Every day. Every day. Every. When we started evangelism, we had 40 days of prayer before, 30 days of prayer during evangelism, and another 10 after. All together, 80 days of prayer. When we did evangelism, we had, right in the middle of the sermon, I would start a story, and when the story was really interesting, I would stop, like the movie stops because there is a commercial. I would stop and say, hey, let's eat together. And people eat and talk and build friendship, and then they come back to hear the, the end of the story. <laughs> and then they would come back and we would continue. And we did evangelism for a month. And we had raw hosts. For every row, there was a host. For every row, there was a host. That host took care of the row, gave them materials, prayed for them, 
and learned to know them. And when they got baptized, that person knew those people. So he was continuing to visit them, to pray with them. So when they get baptized, they have a friend. They have somebody to visit them. They have somebody to call them. They have somebody to pray with. So they don't come in the church and they are alone. They have friends in the church. They have support when they struggle with Sabbath or something or family. And so we had robots. Anyway, we did evangelism. People who work, they feel that they have a reason to come. People who are lazy, they don't come. So I gave jobs to the visitors. I told one visitor, I would like to, to clean the trash in front of the church. The other one, I would like you to take care of the parking. The other one, it was a girl. She, she was dressed so and so, not very... Uh, Okay. And I said, I need you to do a job. And she was a visitor. And she says, do you want me to preach? I said, God forbid, no. Do you want me to sing? No. What, what do you want me to do? I want you to stay at the door. I have only two elderly greeting people. I want you to greet the young. When they come, you give them a hug and say, welcome to our church. Can you do that? She says, yeah. I said, hey. I want you to be enthusiastic, not, yeah, yeah. I want you to say, welcome to our church. She said, like this, welcome to our church. I said, no, be happier. Welcome to our church. That's the way. She stayed at the church. Three days later, she comes to me, pastor, our church is wonderful. It's already her church. Our church is wonderful. I said, why do you say that? I am happy to greet everybody. I feel that God is using me. Because when people work, People grow. Lazy people do nothing. What they do, they just criticize those who work. Workers don't have time to criticize because they are busy serving God. Listen carefully, church. Lazy Adventists are no Adventists. Only those who work. Ellen White says, those that have been, listen carefully, those that have been truly converted have a passion for the lost. And she says, they love the lost as Jesus loves. And then she says, those that don't feel a passion for the lost have never been converted even if they have been baptized. And she says, they should be concerned for their salvation. If you don't have a passion for the lost, as Jesus has a passion for the lost, you have never been converted. God loved people. He gave his love to save the lost. Am I right? And he called you to be missionaries. So I gave work to everybody. I told them, in my church, the Adventist church has 28 doctrines. I have 29. They said, what do you mean, pastor? In my church, the 29 doctrine is that you should not be lazy. You shall not be lazy. If you are lazy, you don't get baptized in my church. When you get baptized, you are a worker. If you are lazy, go to another church. You are not welcome here. Pastor, but I work. Then you are welcome. Everybody has to work. You follow me? How many people have to work? How many? Okay, praise the Lord. And so, we had evangelism. I had one time I spoke, one time Dr. Cluze, one time different speakers. When Dr. Cluze spoke, he's one of the greatest speakers that I know. There are many good speakers. He's one of them. Martin Lee, Ron Cluze, and so on. I'm not going to give you the names. Sean Bursa, and so on. When Dr. Cluzet spoke, he also did evangelism in the next city, bigger city, more people, more poor. We baptized 51, the next city baptized zero. The pastor comes to me and says, did he give a better sermon? I said, no, he gave the same sermon, same slides. Then why did you baptize 51 and I baptized zero? And I said, how many days did you pray? Uh, we didn't. I said, we prayed 80 days. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe in God's power. I said, how many Bible studies did you do? Zero. We did 270. How many community actions, activities did you do? Zero. Well, we did about three months every Sunday. How many seminars in the church did you do? Zero. Well, we did about... I would say about 24, 25 seminars in the church. Do you understand what I am trying to say? You cannot do nothing and expect something. Pastor, our church doesn't grow. That's because of you. Please don't be offended. If you get offended, I will pray for you. 
is not because of God, is not because of people. You cannot harvest tomatoes if you didn't plant tomatoes. You need to plant them, water them, and then you can harvest them. You cannot harvest people if you didn't plant, you follow me? But if you pray and work, God is going to bless your work with results. And so, we had evangelists. Sure, after that, we had follow-up. Because we think sometimes that if we have somebody baptized, that's the end of the story. No! To be baptized is to be born again. When you have a baby, when the baby is born, is not the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story. Because the baby doesn't take care of itself. That's child abuse. The baby needs to be fed. The diaper needs to be changed. Because they don't take care of the babies, they leave the church. Or some of them never grow up. They are 40 years old in the church and they still wear diapers and stink. They have been baptized 40 years ago and they still... I stank and nobody applauded. I'm not going back. Oh, grow up. This is what the member said to me. I am not going back. We have babies in the church. Because we don't take care of them. When a baby is born, you need to take care of the baby. To make sure the baby is fed. To make sure the baby is growing. It's not enough to be born. You need to grow from milk to strong food. From baby to the stature of fullness of Christ. To spiritual maturity. And you need to take care of the babies. To follow up. So to make sure that these are healthy, strong members. Not problem members. So we had follow-up. We, we told not enough that they got Bible studies nine months at home, not enough that they heard second time during the 30 days evangelism. Now we did third time. We had the pastor class when they all came and then we had interaction, question, answer, discussion. Why this? Why that? Until they were solid. And then, not only that, I said, God gave people gifts. I gave a gift discovery seminar and then I said, God gave people gifts. You got to use your gifts, otherwise you lose your salvation. Okay, so these are the jobs. According to your gifts, each one register for a job. And I had the jobs list on the back of the church, and each new baptized register for a job. And people that had music talent register for the worship, and people that had teaching talent to help with the Sabbath school, and people that had business talent, and people that had agricultural talent, take care of the grass, and people who had, you follow me? And everybody had to work. And then all of the new baptized, I told them, in my church, you all give a Bible study. Because when they teach others, they, the new baptized, become strong. So I said, you all give a Bible. So in January, when we started the cycle again, each new baptized started to teach his family and his friends. So the church, if each member, think about that, gives one Bible study. Can you imagine if you have 100 members and each one does one Bible study or two? Do you know how fast the church is growing? They all became strong. I remember out of 51 baptized, there was a lady who says, I don't want to work. I don't want to give Bible studies. All 51 except her stayed in the church. She left the church after three months because people who do nothing, they are not spiritually healthy. There was, I remember, a lawyer. I'm not going to tell you his name. He came to evangelist and said, Pastor, I don't believe in God. And I don't want to be baptized. I came here for the health class. Don't you try to manipulate me. I said, listen, man. I don't want you in my church. He said, what? I said, you heard me. If you are not converted, you are going to create a bunch of problems and you are a lawyer. Why would I want you in my church? I said, stay away. He said, uh, you should want me to be baptized. I said, no. You should want to be baptized. Not me. Because it's your salvation, not mine. He says, so you're not going to manipulate and push me to get baptized? You need to get baptized. I said, no. You promise? I promise. In fact, I said, when you come to me, I'm going to say no. He said, you're the first pastor that says that. I said, yes. Praise the Lord. He came every night, every night, every night, every night. Two days before we finished, we had baptism. We baptized 50. He comes to me, that was Thursday night. He comes to me Friday. Is it too late, pastor? I said, for what? To be baptized. I said, yes. Please. I said, no. Please. I said, I am kidding. It's not too late. Let's get you baptized. I told you that you are going to beg. He said, yes. 
People desired. People understood. People had fellowship. They ate together. They talked together. They learned together. They prayed together. People would come to me and say, this is the most praying church we have seen. This is the most friendly church we have seen. This church, we feel God's presence. Here we work. Here we learn. Here we feel that God is working. We can see God at work. People loved it. People that left the church 10, 15, 20 years ago came back. People from other churches came to our church. The pastors from other churches called me, hey, Pavel, tell my members to come back to my church. I said, man, I cannot kick them through the door. I cannot say, hey, get out. But why do they come to your church, pastor, instead of coming to my church? Because they are my members. I said, because you need to do what I do. When you have activities and the church is alive, then they come back. But if you do nothing, they don't like it. People from other churches started to come. Every Sabbath we had 40, 50 visitors. Every Sabbath we had a baptism after that. Throughout the year, again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Story after story, before every sermon, before every sermon, before every sermon, would have five minutes sharing. Why? So they know that God is working. Something is happening. Every sermon, before the sermon, we had five minutes of sharing, an interview. I didn't let them talk because some people talk forever. I had the interview. Basically, I asked the questions and you answer to the questions. Not more, nor less. For instance, one time, one comes to me and says, Pastor, I was visiting a guy and he works for Amazon. And he said, everything is good. I just, I'm, if I keep Sabbath, I'm going to lose my job. And he says, I go next week. When I give him the Bible study, he says, oh, Sabbath is not Sunday. I thought Sabbath is Sunday. Sabbath is Saturday. And all the packing in Amazon happens Sunday. So I don't lose my job. Can I be baptized? I said, come and share the story. One Sabbath, I was preaching and there is a girl coming through the back door and she has her hair like this. Have you ever seen people that have no hair here, the hair here? And the hair was red, blue, pink, purple. Whoa. It's like she put her head in some paint or something. And she had rings, 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 a big ring here that you could put a finger through, you know? Rings, 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 rings. It's like she would go to the airport, beep, 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 you know. And she was all rings. She had black pants dropped too much. And she had a chain here. She said, whoa, stay away, you know. And she, she came late. She came in the back. She sat in the back. When I finished the sermon, she didn't stay for the kumbaya. She didn't stay for the prayer. She got up and she left. My saints, my members, they stayed for the song, for the prayer, and nobody prayed for her. And I told them, nobody should enter our church without being prayed for. Nobody prayed for her. During the song, I see her leaving. I get from the pulpit. I run. Maybe my members thought that I ate too much watermelon or something. I run after her. She gets out. I go out. She runs to the car. I run to the car. She opens the door. I close the door. She says, uh, uh, I want to go home. I said, don't worry. I'm not going to take you to my home. I have a wife. You will go home. I just want to talk. She says, I don't want to talk. Then keep quiet. I will talk. She says, but I don't believe in God. Don't you ever argue with them. When you argue, they argue. You argue, they argue. Never good comes out of arguments. Jesus didn't argue with them. Jesus asked them a question and let them answer their own question. You follow me? So instead of, she says, I don't believe in God. I didn't say, please believe in God. I said, you are drunk. She says, what? I said, you are drunk. She said, I'm not drunk. I said, yes, you are. Pastor, I am not drunk. I said, yes, you are. No, I am not. Yes, you are. Why do you say that I am drunk? Very simple. You said you don't believe in God, but you come to church. Are you drunk? What are you doing here? Is you got in the car? Uh, oops, I'm at the church. Why don't you go to the movie theater? If you don't believe in God, why are you in a church? Are you drunk? She says, ah, I got you. I do believe in God. I just don't believe in prayer. I didn't say, please believe in prayer. I said, I know why. Why? You have blue eyes. She says, what? I said, you have blue eyes. God hates people with blue eyes. When you have blue eyes and pray, he says, ah, and turns his back. 
Now, if you have brown eyes like mine, he loves you and answers your prayer. She says, Pastor, you are crazy. God answers every prayer regardless the color of the eyes. I said, I got you. You told me you don't believe in prayer, and now you told me that God answers every prayer regardless. Make up your mind. She says, oh, you cornered me. I said, I love cornering people. She says, Pastor, it's not that I don't believe in prayer. Theoretically, I believe. Practically, it doesn't work. I said, tell me more. She started to open, and I was ready to listen, because if you don't listen, you have no right to speak. So I started to listen. I said, tell me more. He says, Pastor, I've been in drugs all my life for 16 years. And she took the sleeve up and she showed me, for 16 years, I inject drugs every two, three hours. And if I don't do it, I start shaking. I'm dependent. And I've been in prison and I've been in rehab and I've been in there and I've been there and I, I went to hospital and I went and I prayed and God never gave me victory over drugs. God doesn't answer my prayer. I don't deserve it. I am a sinner. I said, have you prayed that God forgives your sins? All my life, and God never forgave me. She said, what? What does the Bible say? If you confess, what is your part? Confess. God is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. Do you think you are better than God? If you confess do your part, he doesn't do his part? Pastor, I did confess, but I didn't feel that I am forgiven. I said, hello, forgiveness is not electricity. You don't feel it. Oh, I am forgiven. You don't feel forgiveness. You don't smell forgiveness. You don't touch forgiveness. Forgiveness is by faith. For by faith you have been saved. It's by faith. You believe. You take God's word. God doesn't lie. If God says, if God promises, when you confess you are forgiven, you take his word and you believe that God doesn't lie. Because Jesus died paid with his blood for that. So he, when he says, in the moment you confess, in that moment he says, you are forgiven, you are forgiven. You don't need to feel it. You need to believe it. Oh, I never heard that. But that's the reason we talk. And he says, but how do I get victory? I said, step number one, you confess, in that moment you are forgiven. You believe and you praise the Lord and say, thank you for forgiving me. What if I am not forgiven? You are forgiven, stop doubting God's promise. God doesn't lie. Take his word. In the moment you confess, God takes your sin upon himself and he gives his righteousness upon yourself. And God is the one who committed the sin and you are righteous because he gives you his robe of righteousness. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing that God, the righteous, gives you his perfect divine righteousness his righteousness is yours and takes your sin as he did it upon himself. And you are righteous and he's the sinner. And he pays on the cross for your sin, though he never sinned. Isn't that beautiful? And I said, you just need to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And to praise him and jump up and down and whistle. He said, okay, I confess and I believe. Step number two, pastor. He said, very simple. Step number two. How do you pray? She said, I pray. Tell me how you pray. Well, I pray. Tell me how. So what, do you want me to pray now? Yes. So what I say, Lord, I am a sinner. Please, Lord, forgive me. I'm in drugs. I'm in drugs. Lord, I take drugs. I'm an addict. Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm a drug. Lord, I'm a... Please take me. Give me victory over drugs, Lord. He says, stop it. I got it. Stop it. He says, how, how do you want me to pray? I said, you keep your eyes on drugs instead of keeping your eyes on Jesus. Paul says, I forget what is behind. Uh, run for the goal ahead and keep my eyes on behind or on the captain of my salvation. Where do you keep your eyes? When Peter looked to Jesus, he walked on water. When he looked to water, he went down. I said, you are not supposed to keep your eyes on problems, on sins, on self, on drugs. After you are forgiven, you are no longer a sinner. God gave you a new start. Oh, I got excited. God gave you a new start. You are born again. You are holy. You are a new baby, born again, no more sin. Your sin has been erased, has been Paid on the cross, you receive Jesus' blood and his blood is sufficient. You, Jesus took your sin, threw it in the, at the bottom of the sea. And he put a no fishing sign above. And then you are forgiven. In that moment, you have a fresh new start. Point number two, from that moment, you don't keep your eyes on drugs. Because if you keep your eyes on drugs, Elena says, 
when we keep our eyes on sin, we keep going back to that sin. Because whatever you dwell on, that's what your mind does. You turn your eyes upon Jesus. You keep your, you look, you don't look to Jericho wars. You don't look to Jericho giants. You look to God. We have nothing to fear unless we shall. You follow me? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Don't look to yourself. Don't look to your problems. Don't look to your sins. Satan wants you to look to them so you get discouraged because a, a, a discouraged Christian, it's a useless Christian. You need faith because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So Ellen White says, don't let emotions control you. She says, look to God's promise. She says, don't pray doubt. She says, don't talk doubt. She says, I have the quotation. She says, pray faith, talk faith, sing faith, behave like your faith is invisible because you have an invisible God. And Elena says, if you have faith, God will do the change. You follow me? So I told her, I said, stop talking drugs. Talk victory. Take your eyes from your sin and your weakness. Put your eyes on God because his grace is sufficient. His, Paul says, who is going to save me from this body? And he says, praise be to God. And then in another verse, I can do all things in Christ. I said, keep your eyes on Christ. Step number two, stop praying drugs. Start praying Jesus. You understand what I mean? Stop talking doubt. Stop talking sin. Stop thinking, looking to sin. Turn your eyes, fill your mind with Jesus, with his promises, with his power, with his victory, with his love. Because the more you talk drugs, the more you go to drugs. But the more you talk Jesus, the more you have his presence, the more you know him the more you trust him, the more your mind takes the shape of the things you behold. If you fill your mind with this, that's what you do. But if you fill your mind with Jesus, when he comes in, Satan has no more access. So I said, talk promises. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Talk about him. Don't talk about drugs. And step number three, I said, she says, okay. What is step number three? I told her, I said, step number three, you need to give a Bible study. She says, What? I said, you need to give a Bible study. Why? What's the connection between Bible study and drugs? I said, very simple. After you are forgiven and after you put your eyes on Jesus, you will never grow to maturity unless you work. By working, you become stronger and grow. Do you want to grow or you want to remain a baby? Always weak. You need to grow strong. Therefore, you need to serve and you need to work. You need to give a... I don't know how to teach. I said, praise the Lord. I don't want you to teach because you are going to teach them stupid stuff. I said, this is what you do. You knock in the door and you say, this is study number one, bye. And you leave. You don't talk. Next week, you knock in the door, you say, this is study number two and you leave. Next week, you say, this is study number three and you say, can I pray with you? Next week, you say, this is study number four and you say, can I come inside and pray with you? And next week, you say, can I watch it with you? But you don't talk. You let them watch and you just pray for them. She says, oh, I can do that. But pastor, if I don't get victory over drugs, I will never come back. I said, hallelujah. No problem. I gave her the Bible study. I gave her the address. I said, bye, go. It was 12, 15, Sabbath, noon. 15 minutes later, she called me, pastor, I hate you. I said, well, you are not alone. I hate the church. I hate God. I'll never come back. I said, okay, blah, blah, blah. Tell me why. She says, well, God doesn't condemn me worthy to give a Bible study because I am a sinner. I says, tell me what happened. Don't give me what you think. Tell me what happened. Give me facts. She says, but this is how I feel that I am a sinner. I don't care your feelings. Tell me, I do care, but right now I don't want to hear it. Tell me why you feel that way. Tell me what happened. Well, it's an apartment building that has a uh, intercom and you need to ring the bell and somebody from inside needs to open and nobody's home so God doesn't kind of stop it. Did you pray that God opens the door? Uh, no. Pray, Lord, open the door because I want to give a Bible study. She says, oh, okay. We hang up. The telephone rings again. She says, I prayed. I said, hello. When did you pray? I didn't even have time to put the telephone in my pocket. She says, well, how long do you want me to pray? I said, very simple. Until the door opens. She says, how long? Five minutes? I said, you don't know English. Until the door opens. She said, but tell me in time. Ten minutes, fifteen minutes, half an hour. I said, lady, do you want me to say it in Romanian? Because I see you don't, you don't speak English. She says, no, no, pastor, I do speak English. Pray until 
the door opens. But pastor, what if the door doesn't open? Very simple, you keep praying. And she says, pastor, but how long? I said, lady, you pray until it's night, and then pray until it's morning, and then pray until you get old, and then pray until you get retired, and then pray until you die. And you say, Lord, you can kill me. I'm not going to move from here until you open the door and I give a Bible study because I want to grow. And she says, Pastor, I've never prayed that way. That's the reason you never got an answer. She says, Pastor, do you want me to be so serious in prayer? Duh! Should you not be serious in prayer? I mean, you should be serious in drugs, but not in prayer. Come on. She was quiet. Yes, I get it, Pastor. You pray differently. You are persistent. Hello, doesn't the Bible say that we should be persistent in prayer? And I said, listen, lady, we make a covenant, you and me. You go in your car and pray that God would open the door. And I go in my office and I'm going to sacrifice everything. I'm not going to go home. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to pray in my office as long as you pray in the car. When you call me the door open, the door opened, then I stop praying. So if you pray five days, I pray five days. If you pray two weeks, I pray two weeks. Until the door opens, we are going to pray together. She went in the car. I went in my office. 12.30. At 5.30, she called me. I was hungry. She says, Pastor, I'm happy. You know, I said, why do women cry when they are happy? They are supposed to laugh when they are happy. Stop crying if you are happy. Pastor, I'm happy. I said, tell me the story and tell me short. I'm hungry. Just go to, don't give me introduction and just tell me what happened. She says, well, I prayed the nicest prayer my mom taught me when I was small and nothing happened. And then I kind of opened my heart and I started to really talk openly with God. And I said, Lord, I said, lady, when you open a heart and you started to really talk to the Lord, that's when you started to pray. Because prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. And she says, I said, Lord, I know I am a sinner. I know I don't deserve it, but please would you let me work with somebody? Because the pastor said that if I work with somebody, I will grow. Would you please, Lord, open the door? I said, Pastor, the door opened. An African-American, big, tall guy, like a Schwarzenegger, big guy, with big ponytail, with leather jacket, and skeleton head on the back. You know who are those? Motorcycle gangs. He said, a motorcycle gang person came through the door. He had the trash to go to the trash container. And I stopped praying and I ran to him and I said, can you please let me enter? And she, he says, why don't you ring the bell? She says, well, I did, but nobody is home. Then I don't let you in? She says, please, why do you want to go in? I want to give a Bible study to apartment number 14. But that, if nobody is home, how can you give them a Bible study? She says, that's okay. I'm going to stick it under the door. He says, no, and I am upset with you. And she says, why? You don't even know me. He says, because I asked for a Bible study and nobody came. And she says, wonderful, then I can give you the Bible study. He says, okay, come in. She says, no, 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 no. The pastor said that first time I just give you and leave. The third time I come in. He says, lady, I've never had a Bible. I've never had a Bible study. I don't know how to study. You offer the Bible study. Come in and teach me how to study. She says, pastor, I went in. He said, sit down. I sat down. He got up and he left. I was alone in his apartment. Should I stay? Should I leave? After five terminals, he came back with 11 other big guys, all motorcycle gang. I said, Pastor, I started to pray for my safety. And she was the leader of the gang. And he said, Fox, sit down. And everybody obeyed him. He was the leader. He said, Fox, last week we talked in the bar. And I said, we have been drinking all our life, smoking all our life taking drugs all our life, and drugs are going to kill us. So first time in my life I prayed, and I said, if there is a God, and if you can hear me, please send an angel to help up, give up, help us give up drugs. And he said, God sent an angel, sit down and listen to her. I said, Pastor, I told him, I am not an angel. And I am a drug addict just as they are. But I told them, if they confess and they believe they are forgiven, and I told them they should not talk drugs or doubt, but they should talk hope and Jesus and promises. They should keep their eyes not on drugs, but when they pray, should keep their eyes on Jesus. Because the more they know him, the more they trust him, the more they 
he can work in their life. And then I told them, they need to give a Bible study so they can grow. She was now teaching them. She was the teacher. And she says, they told me, we don't know how to give a Bible study. So I told them, no problem. First time you knock in the door, but you leave. Second time you knock in the door. Third time you pray with them at the door. Fourth time you pray with them inside. Fifth time you go and watch with them. And she said, you don't need to teach. You give them the DVD and you just watch it with them. Let the TV teach them. And she said, I taught them how to give a Bible study just as you taught me, Pastor. And then I said, what happened next? We all watched the DVD. And then she said, Pastor, all those big men started to cry. And they said, we have never heard anything so good. Please come back. And she said, Pastor, when I came to the church in the morning, it was my desperation. I wanted to kill myself. And I said, if God doesn't work today, I got tired of this life. I'm going to go home and end my life. But she says, this is the best day of my life. I really love what happened today. I can sense God's power. I did drugs at 9 and now it's 5.30 and I am not shaking and I have no need and no desire. In fact, I would love to give another Bible study. I said, lady, when you are connected with God, Satan has no power, no access. When God comes in, Satan and God don't live together. When God comes in, Satan runs out. Jesus says, if you remain in me and I in you, you will produce fruits. But if you separate from me, you are nothing. You will do nothing. So this is how you know. If you have no fruits, it means you are separated from him. Because if you remain in him, his presence in you gives you growth and fruits and victory. And I say, lady, Satan has no access to you because you were connected to God. Make sure that you don't separate. And if you separate, go back to him. And the more you go to him, the more you learn to stay with him until Satan has no more, he's no longer welcome in your life. And she said, Pastor, I love you. I said, that's enough. My wife loves me. I said, next Sabbath, I want you in front of the church. She said, me? In front of the church? I said, yes, you in front of the church. I'm not going to preach. I said, hallelujah, I don't want you to preach. I'm going to have an interview. Next Sabbath, I call her. I said, come here. She came. She didn't have any rings. I didn't tell her to lose the rings, but she alone, the Holy Spirit impressed her. She dropped the rings. Her hair was still crazy, but not colored. She was properly dressed, the pants were not dropped, you know. So I said, listen, did you give a Bible study? Yes. Were you afraid? Yes. Was it difficult? No. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Would you like to do another one? Yes. I said, what about those people? And she said, two of them are here. Yeah, they're not. Every Sabbath, we had a story. Every Sabbath, we had one or two or three stories. That church. You could sense that God is working. There was momentum. There was power. There were baptisms. There were stories. There were miracles. When people pray, God works. That church moved from no baptism for 72 years, from no growth, actually, not no baptism, because they had a few baptisms and a few deaths and a few people moving in, a few people out, but zero growth. In fact, they had declined from no growth, from 90 members. They moved. They moved to about 340 members. I give here very conservative number. Okay, from literally, uh, think about that. When I moved there, 11 people did all the jobs. Now we had 265 people working in a church of 300. When you have 260 people working, that's a healthy church. That's a leading church. That's a beehive where all the bees, everybody works. We had from one Sabbath school class, 16 Sabbath school classes. We had an average of basically 40 visitors a week. We had about, uh, we went literally to around 250 Bible studies a year. No more conflicts. It became a friendly church, a praying church. We had activities every single day of the week in the church, in the community, with the youth, with the elderly, with the women, with the men. We had activities every day. 
we planted another church that started from one family. Now they have over 100 members. Anyway, I could go on and on and on and on. This church had programs on television, programs on the radio. This church had programs on the internet and got to the point to have half million listeners a month from over 87 countries. Half million listeners from around the world listening to one church. Can you imagine 500,000 and it started to grow more and more and more, reaching more and more countries because that church was praying and working. By the way, we did NCD. If you know that is natural church development. That church, the, the, uh, uh, so Schwartz has a survey and he measures eight characteristics. The prayer, the Bible studies, the evangelism, the baptism, the, you know, and every church that does over 65% in these eight characteristics is a growing church. And if it does under 35, it's a dying church. When I moved there, the church was 34%. When I left, it was among top 15 healthiest, fastest growing churches in the world. We were the highest tight paying per capita percentage wise church in the Southern Union. We were the fastest growing church in the Southern Union. When you have that church to grow from nothing, to grow, regular churches would grow 3.2, 3.4%. We are growing 18.6%. Everybody wanted to be part of that church. And I could go on and on and on and on. I'm going to stop here because my time is up. You know how I know. I'm hungry. <laughs> but listen, folks. That can happen any place. That can happen here. God can do it anywhere when people do what Jesus told them clearly to do. When two or three pray together in one accord, it will be given. When people pray and plan and work. Don't you expect results if you don't work? But God called you to work and God is going to make you responsible. And when you work, you get the blessing and you, you grow and your family gets the blessing and your children have a good example and then your children become missionaries. When you don't work, your children don't get involved. When you criticize the church, your children criticize the church. When you don't pray, your children don't pray. But when you work, you give a good example. You are blessed. You have God's presence. Your church is growing. Your family is growing. You do it for you. Not only that the church would grow, you get to grow. You are blessed. And God asked you to do it for a reason. If God told you to do it, if your boss would tell you to do something, you do it. When God tells you to do something, there should be no discussion. When God says go, what should you say? Lord, I don't have time. I don't have money. When God says go, what should you say? Yes, here I am. I'm going. Oh, Jesus, we don't have time. Who gave you life? If you are alive, you have time. Only dead people don't have time. You hear me? Living people have time. They just have other priorities. If you have the right priorities, God promised, seek for the kingdom of God, and the other things I promise will be provided. Listen, folks. God is talking to you. The Holy Spirit is talking to you. Because Jesus is coming soon. Don't be only listener. Be doers. If the Holy Spirit talks to you, do not procrastinate. But act on it. You go home, you put your knee down and you say, Lord, help me to be a praying person from today on. Help me to be a working person from today on. I want to serve. I want to be like Jesus. I ask for help. And when you pray that prayer, God has been waiting for you to pray that prayer. God is going to be happy to answer that prayer. But how many times should you pray that prayer? Every day. It's not something that you do today and that's it. You need to do that from now on. Every day. Amen? If you sense that God is talking to you, what stops you to say yes? 
comfort, fear? Do you love the Lord? Nobody talks. Do you love the Lord? Do you want to obey Him? Then say yes to Him. Say, Lord, give me opportunities. And when God gives you opportunities, use them. Amen? Say, Lord, every day, give me opportunities. Open my eyes to see the people that need my help. When God gives you an opportunity, go in faith. Use those opportunities and trust that the Lord will work and you will see. Amen?